Now in the year 2000, um, I became the seventh CEO in now 93 years. So there's only been seven of us. So lots of constancy of leadership. And I grew up, I had grown up in the system. We were just talking, I've been at Virginia Mason 35 years, and now I've been a CEO for 13. And at that time, um, it was a very interesting time in our history. Uh, we had actually lost money in 1998, 1999. Uh, it was the first time in our history we'd ever lost money. Uh, it was a, a time where some of our very best, I hope you've never been there or never been part of organizations that have been there, but uh, when organizations are in tough times, it's often the very best people that look to potentially leave or think the grass may be greener elsewhere. Um, and the issues were, you know, could this great organization survive? And we weren't about to go under. I mean, we, we had reserves and we were going to make it for a while, but the trajectory we were, we were on was not sustainable. Uh, we also, you know, the questioning of our vision, where were we headed? And so for me as the new CEO who grew up in the system, the, my challenge was how do I build on um, the great things in our culture and in our past and our history, but lead what needed to be very large scale change? And I think that was, that was kind of the landscape uh, within the organization at the time. We also had just seen to Air as Human, the first IOM report came out and talked about you know, oh, close to 100,000 people dying in American hospitals. Uh, but of course, that didn't happen at Virginia Mason, we were convinced. Um, and the landscape in all of healthcare at that time, and un unfortunately, is very similar to the landscape today. A defect rate that would never be tolerated in any other industry. There have been study after study now, and I was privileged to serve as one of the co-authors of the Institute of Medicine report that that uh, Dave referenced uh, in the last presentation, we again re have shown that the defect rate in healthcare is three or four percent. That um, three percent of every encounter has a defect. And that defect, as I'm sure you know, can range from showing up for your appointment and having no record of your appointment to wrong site surgery or an un unintended death and everything in between. In fact, if aviation had this kind of defect rate, planes would fall out of the sky every day. Uh, if flat screen TVs that we went out and bought, and I had three out of 100 that didn't work right, you know, we wouldn't be buying them. Um, so it, it didn't feel good to know, to under, come to understand this, but it was the reality. And in fact, if it's you or me or members of our family that experiences a defect, uh, it's 100% defect as far as we're concerned. We don't care about the other 97%. We know the cost of poor quality, and we're beginning to see even more dramatically today the cost of poor quality with the penalties for readmissions, not paying for complications that uh, are preventable. Uh, there was a, an old study in the year 2000 that showed $9 billion of cost from six preventable inpatient complications. Six things we know how to prevent causing that magnitude of unnecessary cost. And I think we all know about the access issues. But these were the issues at that time for Virginia Mason that we saw, and they're still the issues today. But the first thing that happened in the year 2000 was uh, the board asked us, who's your customer? And so like, simple question. And like everybody in healthcare, um, and like everybody here, we said the patient. But the board said, sorry. If that were the case, why do things look the way they do? And that was, that was, you know, took me aback. I was not prepared for that kind of pushback. And, um, but then we did a deep dive on our processes. And what did we find out? We found out that, that in reality, things were designed around us, not the patients. They were designed around the doctors, the nurses, the, the technicians, the managers, the staff not around the patients. I mean, think about it. Uh, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars in this country, including at Virginia Mason, to build waiting rooms. I mean, just big spaces filled with chairs, old magazines, fish tanks, waiting, waiting rooms. What are they? They're places so patients can hurry up, be on time, and wait for us. We design it that way or what happens in most hospitals on Saturdays and Sundays. 
Mike mentioned I still see patients, which I do, although not as many as I used to. But you know, rounding and um, and Mrs. Jones, we can send you home today, a Friday, uh, if your home health's ready and your test results come back okay and you're continuing to feel well, or we'll send you home on Monday. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, what what happened to Saturday and Sunday? And there are numerous other examples um, of what we discovered on our deep dive, which was that our systems were designed around us. And so we got really clear about who's the customer. Uh, Mary McClinton came to us in November of 2004. We were already three years on this journey. And she came to us for a tertiary procedure, but one that we do almost every week at Virginia Mason. And we failed it. She died of a preventable medical error. It was, you know, it was the darkest, deepest, darkest, saddest, deeply um, regretted time in our history. And we went public. As soon as we heard what happened, we went public. Now, it was really only the second time, and I'm sure, this, I'm sure there were others, but second time in a well-known way that any healthcare institution had gone public. And we had a lot of debate about this internally. Um, Betsy Lehman, who's the Boston Globe reporter that uh, died of an overdose of chemotherapy, was, had, had, go, had been talked about in the, in the press nationally. And we said, actually, once we find out what happened, how can we not tell the truth? And so we went public, and we were just fried. We were, the local media beat us up bad. Um, and I'm sure many of you heard about this. We were on Good Morning America. Uh, I got emails from people in Europe because Reuters news agency had picked it up. You know, how could you have killed this woman in your hospital? But it was the right thing to do. In fact, we found out within a week of going public that, that the same error had occurred in another hospital um, in our community, but it had been two years earlier, but it had been swept under the rug. So it was, it was the right thing to do. But it accelerated our commitment around this work. It just basically said, you know, if we are serious about quality, we can't be neglectful of safety. And in fact, we had one organizational goal for the three subsequent years, 2005, 6, and 7, and that was to protect our patients from avoidable harm. We began to see that the literature in other industries supported this statement, that you could actually do what you're doing today with half the people, half the space, half the equipment, inventory, new product is development time, et cetera. Or the corollary, that you could do twice what you're doing today with the same resources. I said, no way. This is like impossible, doesn't compute, the math won't work. And now about 1,300 workshops later, Almost everyone has yielded metrics of one sort or another in, in this magnitude. It does happen. It is possible. We need to realize that we make things in healthcare. We make office visits, we make surgical procedures, we make inpatient stays, we make bills, laboratory tests. And when you think about it that way, it forces you to think about the processes that go into making things. And I remember when we said we were going to Japan, one of our surgeons in the back of the auditorium set up, um, stood up and said, you know, automobiles, airplanes, you know, I deal with life and death. And well, it turns out, you know, if a plane falls out of the sky, that's life or death. Or if a car fails going down the freeway, that's life or death. So we came home pretty humble and believing that here in life was a management system that could be the answer to what we were looking for at Virginia Mason. In fact, before we came home, I'll never forget these days, I mean, it was a lot of debate and discussion, argument. Before we came home, we declared this would be our management system. Now, a few years ago, Boeing came to us and Boeing said, we would like you to work with us to lower the cost of care for our sickest patients, our sickest employees, but who are still employable by 15%. These are people with diabetes, hypertension, depression, 
variety of comorbidities, but still working. We looked at that, you know, Boeing's got some real clout in our market, and we said, okay, we'll work with you on that. So we did. We worked uh, with the primary care team. We created a whole new model of primary care, which led us to get to our uh, primary care medical home. We don't call it that, but to our intensive primary care model. Um, we actually put coaches, health coaches, as part of this model. And these are the results. We were able to reduce the cost of care against matched controls for this cohort of patients by 33%. Boeing was very pleased. Now we reduced it by reducing uh, admissions by close to, by over 50% and bed days by 80%. And in fact, Boeing was so pleased, they said, we'd like to expand this program and do it for more people. This is our orthopedic total joint replacement value stream, starting in the clinic, going through peri-op, inpatient care, follow-up care, and we have this kind of granular detail for every step of the process. Every one of these clouds, lightning bolts, is an opportunity. We know that in, our, in our, what our current state was before we started our improvement work, that over 90% of the time was non-value added. This was the day of surgery. This was the hospital floor day one, day two. Day three, which no longer exists, but this is what it looked like when we did total joints. But this is just to give you an idea of kind of how granular we get with almost every one of our uh, service lines. The board was part and parcel of our decision to go public when Mary McClinton died. And the board is with us every year when we celebrate with Mary's family uh, the patient safety, annual patient safety award that we give to an outstanding team in Mary's memory. So as we think about transformation, this is what we think about. This is what I think about when I think about the Virginia Mason production system, which is about all of this. As leaders, there's technical change, lean, it's the toolbox, it's the improvement method. You need a method, and lean is your foundation just as it is ours. But you need a critical mass to feel urgency you need to have visible and committed leadership, not advocacy leadership. You know, I was a great advocate leader. It was like, I, I go out and my job as an advocate leader was to get all the resources from my department and then keep administration off our backs. I mean, that was my job. I was great at it. But that's not what we need now. We need leaders who are change sponsors. We need a shared vision and we need a, aligned expectations, which we've chosen to do through a compact process. Together, all of those things, I think, are necessary to truly transform. We're on a Kaizen path. You know, this is, we're 11 years into it. This is a, they say it's a 20-year journey to truly transform an organization. I don't want to wait 20 years. We're just trying to jump the curve. We're trying to do the crosswalk so that, hopefully, organizations like yours don't make some of the same mistakes we've made. But we know it's a journey. We were thrilled to be named top hospital of the decade. I won't go to my congressman anymore and say, give me more money. I think we got $2.7 trillion industry. We got enough money in healthcare. We need to change our mindset from one of scarcity to one of abundance. It's what we do with our resources that count. And as leaders, we can provide hope. And this is my last slide, in times of change, Learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. This is the same message that Dave told us just a couple hours ago, that we need to be learning organizations. That's what I want for Virginia Mason. That's what I'm hoping to see in all of healthcare. Let's build this competency to adapt to a rapidly changing environment. Because if we've got it all figured out, the environment's going to change. Let's, and then we'll have to start over, and we don't want to start over. Thank you very much.